Kia ora katu katoa. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to what we anticipate. This will be the first in a series of four information sessions relating to our recent flood events. Just to start, I'll just point out to you that this is being recorded and it is being live streamed. And the reason for that is to enable as wider audience participation as we possibly can, but also to capture later questions where necessary so we can seek answers and publish those. And I'll give a little bit more detail around that in a minute. I just want to acknowledge that tonight is a science-based information presentation. It's not about wider flood protection, structural or technical matters, as we don't have people here who can answer anything related to that, and it is still work in progress. Uh, we recognise that this Buller River flood-related weather information has been topical for many people for some time. And we did endeavour to bring this to you late last year, but COVID intervened. And then we tried again in February, but then a couple of flood events occurred. And even tonight's session has had a wee glitch over the weekend, but one of our key presenters went down with COVID, that being Richard Measures from Niwa, uh, and we wish him a speedy recovery. So tonight we're going to be entirely in Matt Gardner's very expert hands, but a little bit about that later. So just a, a couple of things to remember. If you do have questions outside the scope of Matt's expertise, please remember to frame them sensibly because you are live streaming into people's homes. We have, or we did have a few technical issues with roving microphones. I think they've been resolved. But for in any event, just to ensure that for clarity, I will repeat questions that are asked so we do pick them up on the live stream. Now the process from here, for those of you who have left email contacts, is that we're going to send you a link to tonight's presentation. We'll send you the, re the responses to the question and answers, and we'll provide you with an opportunity for feedback. And for those who haven't got email contact, our uh, copies will also be available at the community hub. Right, so let's move on. Tonight, this is going to be a science-led presentation by Matt Gardner. Matt is going to take us through a wee bit about the Buller River past flood history. He's going to guide us through the July 21 flood events, and then he's going to talk about his flood modelling work and then bring in what we might expect to see in a climate change environment. We also want to be clear that Matt won't be responding to adaptation questions around floor heights or relocation options or flood protection. We just don't have that information. His focus is on bringing you the science behind the recent events. We'll also touch a little bit later on about timelines for options development and future decision making. Just a little later so you're aware and informed of what's ahead of us although detail on that is yet to emerge. And I'll also just acknowledge that for some folk, the facts contained in this presentation may just cause some anxiety. It's never easy dealing with unknowns in a changing environment, but it is important that you're at least aware of what the science is telling us and that you're informed and you're a better place to make decisions into the future. Now tonight's session. So the, tonight is not about the politics or the merits or otherwise of various protection options. Uh, put simply, we just don't have that detail, as I've mentioned, nor do we have expertise to deal with it. And it's not the purpose of this information session. The reason the recovery team are leading this and not other agencies is that we're aware of the high level of interest within the community and about the Buller River and projected climate behaviours and potential effects upon us in the future. So the objective of tonight is to enable us to be better informed and thus make personal judgments around future adaptation options when they become available to us. And that's just a wee way into the future. As I've just mentioned. Now the weeks ahead. The local recovery team is about to begin the process of winding down the recovery program and we intend to transition out by mid-July. And by that time, we envisage that any outstanding actions will have transferred to other agencies to manage. The hub will, of course, still be operating along with navigators. Between now and then, we're going to endeavour to bring you three other information sessions, all of which are very, very relevant to our flood risk situation. So I'll just go through those.
adaptation. That's a session on what it looks like, what the term means, the work being carried out locally, the implications for us as a community, and a brief look at the new and projected legislation. There are several recognised national experts in this quite complex field, and we're hopeful of being able to secure the services of at least one of those. They're very good presenters. The options package and the timelines will be the final in the presentations. Uh, that's an explanation around the package that's presently being crafted due to government in a matter of weeks. And with that will be anticipated timelines and future funded developments and decisions. And I think more importantly, how you get involved in the engagement and the consultation processes that that is going to involve. And the final one that we want to get in is around insurance. So we're going to be doing some work with the Insurance Council of New Zealand, with Tower Insurance, Residential Advisory Services, and potentially other insurance providers to bring you a session around understanding national flood data, costs to communities, and how data and technology and partnerships help inform and educate risk zones and all important premiums. It's not just focused here, it's a nationwide conversation. If you want a bit of a heads up on that, have a look on the Tower website. They have done some excellent risk-based assessment work and it's certainly worth a look at. I'll just move on. This is going to be, in a minute, <laughs> a timeline of the options and decision-making work that's ahead of us. There's a couple of things in relation to this. Firstly, it mentions the Joint Committee. That was established by the West Coast Regional Council for the Westport Rating District. Uh, they've got responsibility for making decisions on physical structure work like stop banks and the ring wall for Westport, and they have expert advice being fed into them by a technical advisory group. We've also got the Buller Recovery Steering Group. That's going to oversee a multi-agency project to investigate all the short and long-term resilience options for Westport, and it is quite a long journey. And you can see uh, on the screen, right through to long term, 2027, that the key things that affect us, as in the here and now, is the work that's about to start, particularly around behind the O'Connor home and around Organs Island and some of the drilling work that's going on around the Esplanade looking for foundations work. That's the here and now, that's part of the $10 million package and that's part of a piece of work that I know everyone's looking forward to getting that in place. Other work will take longer and you'll have options to be able to feed into that as it goes forward and your involvement in engaging in that is going to be crucial. But again, we need to wait on the details. Right. I now just want to turn and introduce Matt Gardner from Land River Sea Consultancy. Uh, Matt's no stranger to the Buller District. He's recognised and he's an expect, a, a respected expert in the field of Buller River flood modelling. He works closely with the West Coast Regional Council, the Westport Technical Advisory Group. He works with the National Institute of Water and Atmospherics and he's provided invaluable advice to us in the West Coast Civil Defence Emergency Management during past flood events. So Matt, I will hand over to you. Thank you. So is this mic's picking up okay? Brilliant, oh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you for taking the time to come out this evening. Um, I know you've all been through a very um, tough time, so just want to just acknowledge everything that everyone in this community's been through. Um, it's not easy having having your town and your houses flooded multiple times in a short period of time. Um, and I'm not coming here with any solutions today, but just want to know that that I know it's not easy, um, but I'm here to try and help you and to try and work with us all, and then hopefully together as a community, um, we can get the best solution for Westport in the long term. But today. As Bob has pointed out, I'm just simply talking about the science behind the Buller floods. Um, now, just a warning, um, there's a hell of a lot of information in here. Um, I've got too much information to present, um, and I've had to leave a lot out and just sort of pick and choose what I can, can include. So, so hopefully I've got enough in there to, for all of us to learn something. Um, Bob's tried to call me an expert. I don't like to call myself that. Um, I'm a professional engineer. I studied engineering about 20 years ago at Canterbury University. Um, I've been working in the field of water resources since then um, and have, yeah, worked on major river systems 
um, from the south to the north, all around the country, and for the past 10 years I've done quite a lot of work for the West Coast Regional Council, so I've got some particular expertise in um, gravel riverbed systems. Um, and the Buller is, is one of my favourites, so I've been working on the Buller since about 2013. Um, so, Bob gave you a brief introduction as to what I will be talking about, so but just roughly, first I'm just going to give you a little bit of background and flood history. Run through the July flood, the model build, the main mechanisms of flooding um, from river flooding, which create risk for the, um, for the town. And then I want to run over some of the changing environment, going back to, well, the earliest maps I have is from about 1860. Um, and then walk through some of them and how has Westport changed today and how does that impact on flood risk? Um, touch very briefly on, on likely future climate change. Um, so first of all, just to set the scene. So we're standing here in Westport at the moment, quite a small town, right at the base of one of the largest catchments in New Zealand. So in terms of flow, the, the Buller catchment has the largest estimated flood flow in New Zealand history. Now this occurred uh, back in 1926, um, we don't, there's no flow gauge in, in the time. We've got a rough estimate, um, which is placed at 12,700 cubics. Now that was worked out in the 1950s using what we call slope area calculations. A lot of uncertainty in that. I'd probably give it plus or minus 25%. But it was a very big event, much bigger than anything we've had in recent history. Um, in 2021, we had the largest gauged flood flow in New Zealand history. So that was about 8,900 cubics. So these are massive flows. So if we just put that in relation to other large rivers around New Zealand, ones you are most likely familiar with, um, in Canterbury at least, the Waimakariri, you all know is quite a large gravel braided river. That has a 100 year um, return estimate flow of about 4,000 4, cubics. The 100 year flow for the Buller River is 9,500. So we're more than twice the flow of the Waimakariri. And if we look at the Rakaia, um, that's about 5,700 cubics. So still, we're almost double the flow of the Rakaia. So, so the key point, the main flood mechanism, it's quite simple, really. We've got a really big catchment that comes out of a narrow gorge and comes onto a very small floodplain, and Westport is centred in, um, in the middle of that floodplain. And so just for those of you who aren't familiar with the geography, that little yellow star is where we're, where we're located. What are the basic hazards we need to consider in Westport? There's more hazards on top of this, but the main ones, we've got river flooding. So river flooding is, is what I was talking about before. We've got a really big catchment. When we get rainfall spread over the entire catchment, um, we can get very significant flows, obviously, feeding down, down through all the valleys, coming out the gorge, into Westport, spills out of the Buller River. We've then got problems of local stormwater flooding. So the local stormwater flooding, why is it all related to rainfall? It's a, it's a different mechanism from the Buller River flooding because the local stormwater flooding occurs when we get very, usually quite short, but intense rainfalls focused over the Westport town area itself, whereas the Buller River flooding mainly occurs when the rainfall's in the upper catchment. We're exposed to coastal flooding. There's risk of storm surge, large waves set up, and there's even um, historic records of tsunami, tsunami impacts. So, um, and those um, storms and tsunamis can come in from all angles. So, so we're, we're, we're basically being hit from above, from, from up the valley as well as the coast. On top of that, um, you all know we're in the west coast, we're very close to the southern fault line. Um, there's a risk of, of major earthquake, and we have a history of earthquakes. So we have the Murchison earthquake back in 1929, as well as the Anangahua earthquake in 1968. Now that one was recorded to create what we call a landslide dam. A um, lot, of, lot of material came down and built up, and that can have a risk of sudden flooding. And along with the landslide dam, it then often brings down large amounts of sediment of gravel into the river for many years to come. So we do have, if we look at the cross-section surveys, there is note that the the, the gravel in the river definitely built up after that Anangahua earthquake and has, has settled out since to a degree. Um, but we can get sudden large pulses of gravel coming into the system. And then there's a risk of liquefaction from earthquake and apparently there's geological records of liquefaction in Westport as well. 
Um, just one thing to note, if sea level continues to rise, um, then the groundwater will likely continue to rise as well, which would make Westport more prone to, to future liquefaction. Um, so I'm now going to run you through some flood history. Some of you will have seen some of this material before. Um, this may be new to many of you, I'm not sure. So um, we've obviously had floods um, in the West Coast going back centuries. I've only got access to European records. Um, and the first flood uh, we've got recorded in the European records is back in, well, the really large flood, there was many floods before this, was in 1873. So the 1873 flood was huge. We don't have an estimation of the flow at all, um, but it did damage or destroy much of the northern end of Westport. Records state that Stanley Wharf, the National Hotel, a large two-storey building and a store were swept away. The river changed course and cut a new channel through what was called the North Spit, making it an island. Um, and there's notes that a slaughterhouse, a piggery and a skin yard and tools on the spit were completely washed away. Um, now, just to put that in context, Westport in, 18, in 1868 was a very different town than what it is today. Um, so we've got a map here. This one is from, I think it's 1878. I don't have my notes in front of me. Um, but basically, it shows you how the town was. Now, looking at a map like that, it can be quite hard to put it in context. So what we've done, we've scanned this into the computer and we can carefully overlay it on top of our, of our current map. And what we find is that these maps are amazing. They're so accurately drawn without any computer technology, and they basically overlay perfectly on top of the town grid that we have today, as well as all the land boundaries, the roads. Um, so here's uh, an overlay with 50% transparency. So we can see that the mouth of the river is where that sort of lagoon estuary area is today the Orowaiti Lagoon was discharging where Snodgrass is today. Um, so it's a very different scene. So just that's the photo, that's the map. So it was a very different, a very different town. Um, and so the flood mechanisms were, as a result, quite different too. Um, and if we trace the shoreline from the 1860s and the 1880s onto the current era of photography, that's what we see. Um, Quite interesting to note, I know some of you are quite aware of it, I've just highlighted there the original outlet of the Orowaiti um, in the 1880s coastline. So basically the Orowaiti could discharge directly to the sea, which it can no longer do. So that area there, which I've highlighted in brown, is all build up, which has occurred because of the construction of the port, because the breakwaters have, have interfered with the coastal current. So I'll go into that into a little bit more detail. Also want to point out Organs Island, the Buller River was completely different. So the, Buller River was straightened in the 1880s um, because in this very flood, such a large amount of water went down the Orowaiti um, that they were concerned that the entire river was going to divert itself down the channel. So there's just that overlay. So you can actually see all of those trees as their historic river alignment. Um, so the relief channel, as they called it at the time, that was the original path of the, of the Buller River. Oh, skipped on too far. And then, so what they did, they just dug a very narrow channel and they allowed the river to do all the hard work itself. So the river just, as floods got bigger and bigger, more freshers came down, the river scoured itself out and has diverted itself down what we call the Buller River today. Um, and the reason they did that, they were worried about the river avulsing or permanently diverting itself the entire Buller River flow down the Orowaiti River. Um, and just to point out here, so this is just a slide. Um, from Napier Bell. This is, he was, um, I believe, the chief engineer for the Westport Harbour back in 1891. So just some notes here. He said, I think that the floods will continue to deepen and widen this channel until in the course of years, the greatest body of water um, will flow down it. This is what we wanted, as the more that passes down the relief channel, the less overflows at the Orowaiti. Um, so just pointing out, this is a problem which we've had since the 1800s, and it's been well recognised and a lot of a lot of people have been working on it ever since. Um, now this is just an aside, but very interesting in the same document, we've got, um, there's basically an, a chart of statement of income and expenditure between uh, 1884 and 1891. It's just very interesting. I'm not an economist, not an expert of finance. I jumped onto Google, as we can all do, and I found a converter, online converter, which converts 19, 1891 value to present day value. Really interesting to see 
that between 1884 and 1891, they spent what we'd call $2.3 million on dredging and total works for constructing the harbour. So this includes um, the breakwaters, design of the overflow, everything in that chart. If you had valued that today, that comes out at over $102 million. So they were obviously making a lot of money out of that port, out of all the exports which were going out of there, all the stuff going back to Great Britain and everything being exported. Um, a lot of value was coming out of the port for them to invest such big money. But so when you look at the costs which are being spent in the current day, just put it into context, well, actually we spent a hell of a lot of money in the past. Um, the next big flood was 1926. Again, there were a number of floods since then, but really big one, the biggest one in history was 1926. Um, the Buller River broke its banks and the entire town was flooded. Um, hundreds of people were rendered homeless um, and the damage was worse in the northern end of town and I believe that's because the bulk of the water likely came back from the Orowaiti as it did in July. Um, so hundreds lost their belongings and flooding was so bad people were having to be rescued off roofs. Um, now so just to put that in context, we think that was about, well that was stated to be 12,700 cumex. The current flood was about 9,000, so this is a much bigger flood than we had in July. Um, we had a relatively quiet period, not completely quiet, there were floods, there was quite a big one in 1950, I haven't bothered putting it in here, but the worst flooding since 1926 was in 1970, um, but of note again, so at Hawke's Crag, which I'm sure most of you know, it was three meter, the Buller River was three meters lower. So it was a big flood, but three meters lower than um, what occurred in 1926. So the bridge was damaged. We had a couple of uh, damaged piers due to debris blocking up behind the piers. The bridge has since been replaced. Um, floor levels were flooded in the northern end of town. Of note again, the northern end of town is where the flooding mainly comes from, from the Orowaiti. Um, the media reports, however, have stated that the Orowaiti did save much of the town. Um, and here's just a few more pictures. So some Gladstone Street, Palmerston. Um, corner of Palmerston and Renwick, I think. So just showing that 1970, we again had quite a significant flood. And I just wanted to highlight the shoreline in the 1970s. So this image here, taken in 1974. Um, and so look at where the coast is. And look at, this is a satellite imagery from 2022. Completely different shoreline. And so what's quite interesting is that there, you can see appears to have been a cut. Now I don't have, there may be records, and I'm sure some of you in the room know more about this than me because I'm not from Westport, I'm from, from Christchurch. So I don't have access to all of the records. I've just found what I can find. Uh, happy, I would love to find out about this, but it looks like someone went to site, probably during the flood, and opened up a bit of a cut or the river burst its way through. I'm not sure, but this is taken at low tide. So the river probably had less than 100 metres to go before it could get out to sea. With today's environment, it's got one and a half kilometres to go because the land's built up. So it's significantly exacerbated flood risk for Westport. Um, the other flooding we've had is Cyclone Fahey. So 2018, I'm sure many of you who were here would remember that. Um, coastal event, inundation, Snodgrass area was quite badly affected as well as some of the lower coastal areas of town. So this is a computer simulation of that event because I don't have a good photo of the full extent, but those blue dots were survey dots of the flood extent surveyed by um, Chris Cole and his team. Uh, here's just an image, this is not taken at the peak, but here's just an image showing some of the inundation through the Snodgrass, what we call the Snodgrass area, which just remembering in the 1800s was the original outlet of the Oroiti. So it shouldn't be surprising because it's quite low-lying land that was actually river channel. Uh, so in summary, we've been flooded quite badly on many occasions. We've had buildings washed away, homelessness, and the slowly growing coastline has exacerbated flood risk from the Oroiti. Um, and there's no reason, as we found out in July, but there's no reason again why this couldn't happen tomorrow. Fingers crossed it won't, but it's a bit of a roll of the dice. So I feel a bit sorry for you because Richard Measures was supposed to be taking over from me for the next 15 minutes. Um, unfortunately, I've got to step in for him, so you're stuck with me for a whole hour, or possibly more than an hour. I've got quite a bit to get through. But basically what I'm going to run through is some NEWA side slides provided by NEWA. I'm going to run through the weather systems, the rainfall, catchment inflows, river flow and flood frequency, as well as flood level data. 
Um, so the first slide which I want to show you is just what is the general weather system that creates the flooding. So what we have here is an atmospheric river um, which is thousands of kilometres long. Um, so it comes around the north of Australia, across the Tasman Sea, sucking up moisture as it goes, um, especially when the Tasman Sea gets warmer as it has been in the past several years, so it's able to suck up more moisture. And what happens, I'll just show you that again, that moisture is funneled down like a fire hose directly at Westport. Um, when other areas get flooding, this isn't only unique to Westport, sometimes that focuses itself at Brisbane, or sometimes at Auckland. But in this occasion, with this particular setup, Westport was the firing line. And so here's just a, um, another view of the same thing. This is a, a map of what we call integrated vapour um, transport. I um, hope I've got that right. I don't have notes in front of me. Um, so basically, the key thing here is that you can see you've got that, that red area, which is excessive moisture, focused right at Westport. Now, what's really interesting is that Niwa have access to historic weather records and they can make computer generations of the exact same um, weather systems from history. And if you go through all the, all the weather events and if you look at the 1950 and the 1970 flood, you've got an almost identical weather pattern. So these are, occurred in 1950, 1970, then 2021. So they're quite rare events, but when the stars align and this Hose, fire hose gets pointed at Westport, that's when we get the really bad floods. Um, so moving on, here's just a catchment map. Just one thing we want to highlight here is the vast size of the catchment, um, north to south, east to west. And in terms of flood monitoring and flood forecasting, this, this is the West Coast Regional Council and Niwa monitoring gauges. The red squares are flow gauges and the black triangles are rain gauges. So these are all telemetered and, and the council staff are able to monitor these 24-7 and once, once a few alarm bells start ringing, then, then it's all hands on deck and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then this map here is just another visualisation put together by um, the Niwa, Niwa weather team. Um, and it's just showing rainfall intensity. Now, now purple indicates rainfall, dark purple indicates more than 200 mils over 48 hours. So as you can see, the key thing here is the vast area over which the rainfall occurred. So that's quite rare. Most of the events are over parts of the catchment. This rainfall event went over the entire catchment um, and it also spilled over into other catchments. So we also had significant flooding, close to one in 100 year um, return period event in the Waido River as well in the Marlborough region. So that's another river which I'm heavily involved in. I've done all of the flood modelling for, for that river also. So I had two events in July 2021 flooding at the same time. Um, so Niwa's team, um, we're quite fortunate really that this, this flood event occurred during the daytime because quite often they happen in the middle of the night and you don't know what's happened. But because it was a daytime flood and there was lots of advance warning that it was coming, Niwa were there with their jet boat and their equipment and they were carrying out surface velocity gauging um, of the river. So they're measuring how fast the water is flowing, doing calculations with area and volume um, and they can get a very accurate estimate of what the flow was. So there's just a, a video of why they were out in sight. That's the main Buller River. And then we also show you, um, we cut to the Orowati Bridge also. Um, we can see the water spilling over the causeway. So basically what they're doing is they're, we have what we call a rating curve, which is how we determine how much water flows down the river based on the level of the river. But it's very rare that we actually make a gauging, and lots of the gaugings are carried out at low flow. So by having this really high flow gauging, it just decreases the uncertainty in the flow measurement. Um, so yeah, so that was really good. So one thing you saw earlier, I'm not sure if you spotted it, was a massive log floating down the river, which luckily didn't snag behind the pier. But I'll get a little bit more to that. So, so that was the gauging carried out. But every day we've got a flow recorder running in the Buller River. The main, the main gauge which we rely on is the Takuha flow recorder. Um, so it was installed in 1963. We've got almost continuous records since then. Um, and we also have some earlier data um, from predecessor sites, specifically Berlin's, going back to 1951. Um, and we've got both Niwa and West Coast instruments here. So all I need to point out here, that cylinder is the flow recorder. Um, this was, photo was taken a few days after the event that's how high the water got in July. Um, and in 1926, it would have been a, a, at least a metre or so 
above that. So there's a, a vast amount of water coming down our river. Um, and here's a plot, all this plot shows is your annual, the largest flow of each year, what we call an annual maxima series. So all I want to highlight there is that every year we get a reasonably large flood, 3,000, 4,000 cumex. Generally, nothing happens. Every now and again, we get that really big rainfall event. What I wanted to point out here was that 17 July 2021 20, was the largest event we've had since the gauge was installed, and it's quite a bit larger than the other ones. Um, Oh, sorry, you can go back to that 1970 flood was 8,200. Whereas 8,900, um, we've got about 700 cumex more for July 2020. And if, the, if we then on data from Berlin, so you can see there was nothing that big, but that 26 May 1950, which was the event which happened before they installed the gauge, again, reactive management. We've had a very large flow event in the Buller River. Everyone is going, what the hell is going on? We'd better install a gauge. It's always the way it works in New Zealand. Everything's always after the flood. So really interesting. Um, the, we've had good gauging since the 1950s. Um, and you can see that first line, sorry, was the 1926 flood. I think that's a massive overestimate. Per personally, I've, I've had a look at slope area calculations. Generally, um, they overestimate flow. So I'd be surprised if it is as big as shown on there, 12,700. But definitely, it's probably at least 11,000. So 10 to 11 minimum. Um, it's a very big flood. Um, just very quickly, return period. Return period science is looking at the probability of flow. Hydrologists love statistics. Um, but what we have to acknowledge with, with flow measurement, highly uncertain. There's so much going on in that river, it's very difficult to accurately estimate the flow. So we've done our very best, and we've got a series of historical data, which is also very accurately to pinpoint so as a hydrologist, as a scientist acknowledging uncertainty, I would say that event was somewhere between a 50 and 100 year event. I'd try and avoid giving it a specific return period. If you do plot it on a graph, it sits at about a 60 year, one in 60 year return period event. But realistically, I wouldn't say that because we've got so much uncertainty. Somewhere 50 year to 100 year event, that's, that's the best we know. Let's not try and pretend we know more than we do. Um, flood level surveys, so the NEWA team were were really lucky. Um, they'd been given a heads up. They had a crew over there. They went round. There's just a picture of them surveying what we call debris levels. So debris, as well as the coals. So, so the coals had a team. Niwa had a team. They worked really well together. They went round and they surveyed flood levels. So I think we had about 240 flood levels recorded throughout the floodplain. And it's a really good record, which we can now use for planning purposes. Um, here's just a sample of the flood levels. Um, so we know how high the water was and what the extent was. And then from that, we've made a map. We fed that all into the computer, combined it with the LiDAR information and made a map of what we believe the flood extent was. And we've verified that to a degree on the ground. And, and most people generally think it, it checks out very well. There'll be areas which are wrong. Happy to say that. Um, but overall, it gives a pretty good estimation as to what the extent was. Um, so very quickly, I'm not going to go into any details of the model build, but just for a timeline, the model was first published in 2015. It was peer-reviewed and adopted at the time, um, and that model was calibrated to the July 2012 event, which was the largest event we had on record, uh, which had debris levels. So the new model, which you're seeing now, is just simply an upgrade to this old model. So for those of you who have been relying on the previous data, it's changed, but it's not changed significantly. The flood extent is more or less the same. Flood depths have gone up in some places and down in others. And that's just, we've got heaps of more data now. Um, so here's just some screenshots from the old model showing that it was calibrated um, to the 2012 event. These are just photos. The photos on the left is a helicopter photo from the 2012 event. Photo on the right is a replication of the model. Um, so you can see it gave, a, it gave a pretty good fit in terms of extent. And then we also had debris levels, which we used to calibrate the model to. So that was 2014 when I was building that. We've now upgraded the model. We've got new LiDAR data, new cross-section survey. The beauty of the LiDAR is it was flown at low tide, which has allowed us to pick up a lot more details than the previous LiDAR. And the extent of the old LiDAR was very small. It didn't even cover the entire Westport area. So the rest of the model, anything outside of that yellow box, wasn't made up, but it was, it was interpolated based off, based off quite coarse survey data. GIS maps, different bits of information which we could get to piece together a good terrain model. We've now got regional wide LiDAR, well, for the Westport region at least, and the rest of the West Coast is coming. So 
for, for, um, for those of us involved in, in flood risk modeling. It's really useful um, data. Um, so here's just a, what we call a hillshade visualization of the LIDAR. So this is the 2008 LIDAR, which by the way was really good data and not many areas in New Zealand actually had a, access to really good LIDAR in 2008. So Westport was really lucky to have it. Um, but this new LIDAR is not as high resolution, but it's got much better coverage and because it was flown at low tide, uh, you might be able to see there. Um, does that pointer work? Where are we? We've got those. Um, you can see the build-up of the, um, sorry, see the, see the sandbars and everything because the entire Orowaiti is basically exposed at low tide. So it's really beautiful data to work with. Um, it means we can make less assumptions. And then we've calibrated the model to those 240-odd um, debris levels. And so each one of those yellow numbers is basically the difference between the modeled flood level and the measured flood level. So you can see some of them are 10 centimeters. 0.1 is 10 centimeters. 0.2 is 20 centimeters. So plus or minus 10, 20 centimeters. But if we do the statistics on the whole model, we get an average error of average error of four centimeters and an average absolute error, which is one I prefer to use, of 15 centimeters. So that's telling me that overall, most of the area of the model is plus or minus 15 centimeters. Um, so move on, and what I just want to show you now is just an animation of the model. So this is just the calibration run which we've used, and this just is a really nice way to walk through the dynamics of the flood event, because you couldn't actually see it happening, and it happened over you know, a couple of days, really. So we can see this in one minute now. So what's happening here, um, the Buller River is filling up, um, slowly filling up, and spilling out at Organs Island at the Orowaiti overflow area. And you can see it starts spilling down the Orowaiti. So you can see that creeping down towards the lagoon. It's always hard to decide which colors to choose, by the way. Some people don't like blue because floods are always brown, but brown looks a bit funny. So we've picked red because it stands out. Um, so you can see the, the river's filling up, and, and now there's a bit of a lag between the Buller River and the Orowaiti River. So it starts filling up, and you can see down at the floating basin area, a little bit of overflow is starting to occur. So that's just um, up there. And then it starts spilling. It starts spilling out of the, um, out of the floating basin and starts coming back into town. And then we start getting mixing of floodwaters from the Orowaiti. Some water's now spilling out of the Orowaiti as well as the floating basin. And it starts working its way back up to town. But by now, the Buller River is dropping again. And there's quite a significant lag in the water coming down the Orowaiti overflow than that in the Buller River. So the Buller River is settling down to a degree, um, still going up and down with the tide. But now we've got a lot of water coming down the Orowaiti. Um, so what we see is we start getting attacked from all angles. Um, we have water creeping back up some of those local drains, and then it starts spreading its way back through. And it's about a five hour lag, I think. Um, and what we found was that the peak water levels in town actually carried on to about 11 p.m. And um, the model matches very closely with what the civil defense operators, uh, in terms of timing, were telling me during the flood, because I worked through the night on that flood, um, trying to assist with evacuation at the last minute, um, help prioritize areas. So we were using this model to help inform what needed to happen. Um, so moving on. Um, so in addition to calibrating that model, um, so we've had the 2012 event, replicates fairly well, replicates really well for the Feb 21 event. And then we've also got the, the coastal conditions from Niwa so that we can model the cyclone Fahi. And what we find is that the model gives a very good fit. Um, and matches very closely with the recorded debris levels. And the extent, I'm not so sure on, it's been really hard to get a, get a map from anyone, but we've had a good chat to lots of people. Those blue dots are actually the extent, you know, the, the edges where the debris levels were calculated and the feedback that I've got is probably not perfect, but it's a reasonable fit, but the debris levels seem to match closely. And that would be heavily influenced by wind conditions and things, which are quite hard to simulate. But basically what we're saying is the model can replicate both river and coastal flooding. So the model's been peer reviewed again. It's been certified as fit for the purpose of setting floor levels, designing flood protection infrastructure, assessing potential flood mitigation options, um, as well as assessing the impacts of potential future climate change. Right, so just to show you some results. So once we've got a calibrated model, we run what we call design flood. So here is what we've simulated for a 
So NEWA have provided the flood statistics for a 1 in 100 year or 1% annual exceedance probability event. Um, so this is a map. This will be published in more detail at a later stage for you to all look at it in more detail. And then a future climate scenario with well, 0.97 metres of sea level rise, so that's one of the predictions um, out to 2120. Uh, so this is a potential, um, just one potential future climate scenario. And then we've also run coastal storms. Um, so we have, uh, here's a map for a 100-year coastal storm. So you can see it's a little bit more than we experienced in Cyclone Fahey. Um, and then we've also tested that with sea level rise. We've done 20 centimetre intervals. Um, and here's just an example of uh, a map with one metre of of sea level rise, of that exactly the same coastal storm, 100 year probability, no change to that, of the size of the waves and everything coming in. The only thing that's changed is the sea level's a metre higher. And as you can see, a vast majority of Westport um, would be affected. So key conclusions from the model, basically there's severe flood risk, as we all know, for Westport. The highest flood risk comes from the Orowaiti River for moderate size events, so as we already knew that, from previous events in the modelling, but we saw that very clearly in July 21, most of the flood event, most of the flood water came from the Orowaiti. Um, but for really large events, bigger than that event, we then get water coming in from all angles. We get a lot of water coming in from both the Buller as well as the Orowaiti. And, and the balance of water, of flow split between the Buller and the Orowaiti is really delicate. So if we send more water down the Orowaiti, we may get more flooding from that end. But if we push more water down the Buller, we might get more flooding from that side. So it's it's a bit of a tricky balance is one thing that um, the model shows us. Um, and lower areas of town are very exposed to flooding, both coastal and river. Um, and a key thing for evacuation, both bridges get cut off once the, once the water gets too high. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a changing environment. I'll just get a sip of water if you don't mind. So how has Westport changed. This is not about climate change, this is just what's changed between 1880 and now. So um, the first thing I wanted to start off with was the Orowaiti overflow. So the Orowaiti overflow has changed significantly. So as I pointed out earlier, we've had the relief channel, um, which has straightened the river. So this is a 3D version of the 1880s map. I've brought that into our 3D GIS software. Now we go to 1940. One thing to note is that the Orowaiti overflow was heavily vegetated in the 1940s. Um, but by the 70s, a lot of that vegetation was cleared. Now, one impact of clearing the vegetation, the vegetation actually blocks flow from exiting the Buller River. It's quite dense, it traps silts that land can build up. And so by clearing the vegetation, we've actually potentially increased the flood risk down the Orowaiti. Um, we can see again more vegetation has been cleared by the time we get to 2016. So just to allow farming. Um, and then this is moving on to 2022. So we've had some pretty significant changes. Firstly, the river has been straightened and the vegetation has been cleared. Um, just to point out, the intention of the engineer who did the relief channel was to allow the Orowaiti overflow area to be completely vegetated. So this is from that same document, 1891. So we've got Napier Bell has said, um, so we can the foreshore of the Orowaiti can be secured by filling in some of the scour holes with stones and boulders from around the area, but by also by planting up every part of the overflow with willows and blackberries. What he said is once the willow, once the low ground is overgrown with bushes, the sand and the silt of the floods will be rested again and overgrown, and thus the land grows higher after each flood instead of being cut away as it would if it had been neglected. So that's the original design of the Orowaiti overflow. Um, so it's quite interesting hearing a lot of different people have got different opinions around the, how the Orowaiti overflow um, was originally, and that's just some nice historical documents. Um, we've got changes in the river. We get a lot of sediment coming down, as I pointed out. So the, the Buller River is always changing. It's moving up and down. You get gravel pulses coming in. Um, and one of the beauties of today is that we carry out regular cross-section surveys every about four years. The Buller River's been surveyed, not every four years, but sometimes there's bigger gaps. But i sort of run you through here. This is cross section nine. This is, what, a few hundred metres upstream from the bridge. Um, just a random cross section I've picked, but just to walk us through the cross section. So, had a yellow one in 1999. Then we, then we got quite a big gap, actually. We jumped to 2010 as the blue. So you can see it dropped down, then it came back up. 
Then it scaled out a little bit on the right bank, lifted a little bit on the left, 2017. Um, and then 2021, so it's getting a bit hard to read the screen down here, just making sure I get those years correctly. My eyes are not as good as they used to be. Um, and you can see, so I'll just turn the other ones off now, the change between 1999 and 2021. So what we can see, we've got this big gravel island which has appeared on the left. So that's that area there. So when you're standing on the riverbank and looking out of the river, what you see is quite a large gravel mound building up. And over the years it gets bigger and bigger. And your eyes aren't deceiving you, what you're seeing is true. But what you're not seeing is what's happening under the water. And so what we see here is what we call channel asymmetry. And so the right-hand side of the channel has scoured out quite significantly. So I would estimate for this, this particular cross-section, we've probably got an increase in transport capacity at that section because of the significant scour which has occurred on the right-hand side. That's not the case for every cross-section in the Buller. Having a look at the recent surveys, there are a couple of sections which have actually come up. But there's other sections which have gone down quite significantly. Several of the cross sections have got a lot wider. A lot wider. They've stayed the same, but they're about 20 metres wider than they were in the previous survey. So overall, there hasn't been a significant change in the transport capacity of the river, is what the cross section survey show. Between the cross section surveys, again, I admit there's changes that go on. It is evident that there's been some build up, which isn't picked up by the um, by the cross section survey. But the key thing is, is that the river is constantly adjusting for itself. And so I just thought it was a really nice illustration. That's what we see, this is what we don't see. Um, the right bank of the bull has been constantly moving. So again, here's our map from the 1870s. Here's from 1943, is a bit of a missing section. Here's 1974, 2016, 2022. So it might be a little bit hard to see there, so I've made the map again, just looking straight down. So there's our 1868, so on this one, I put black lines, which is our property boundaries, so we can see where the Bullet River Edge was. Once we go 1943, I've now traced on that red line just to show you where the bank edge is. I'm not sure if it, how clearly you can see that on this scale, but basically what it's showing is that that river's moved over about 20 metres. And if you look at that, there's a white line actually in the river channel, that was where the river was in the original survey, the very surf, probably early 1800s. And so we've moved about 50 metres since then. And that's a long-term channel meander of the river. The river deposits sediment on the inside of the bend because it's lower velocity. The river's flowing slower, basically, so it drops gravel. Where it's flowing faster, it carries gravel, so it scours out on the right-hand side and drops the river. So that gravel bar builds up and it's been pushing over. So that's one of the areas where there's currently some, there's already rock protection, and it's being topped up. Um, the advancing coastline, again, I showed this to you before, but just a nice illustration. Also that map, which I had, sorry, just go back to it, this is 1860. Beautiful map, you can see it's not in the best condition. Um, but we've scanned that in, 1860, 1878, 1943, 1974, 2016, 2022. So we can see with our very own eyes, sometimes when you're living there, I know a lot of people here already know this because I've heard them talking about it, but others are not so aware. When you're living there, you don't notice it creeping millimetres every day, but actually it's advancing very rapidly. You can even see increase between 2016 and 22. What's the reason for that build up? It's purely the construction of the breakwaters. It's very evident to see when you look at a map but when you look at the historical documents, this is a document written by the harbour master in the 1960s, um, and he's pointed out, he basically walks us through it. In 1883, the engineer required, sorry, reported that since that wall had been um, constructed, high water mark had advanced three chains seaward. I'm sure Chris Cole knows the conversion of three chains off the top of his head, but that's significant distance. Um, and then, really interesting, you can go through the whole whole documents showing, documenting this, how they measured the predominant drift. They put bricks down at Carter's Beach, and they watched the bricks move every day, and they measured the rate of those bricks drifting down so they could calculate how much sediment was being trapped by the breakwaters. Very well documented, they knew it before they built it, and they documented it. So really interesting here, this last point, the land thus built up as a result of the breakwater, Breakwater extension was surveyed and put up for auction in 1914. 
So the section now known as Kilkenny Park um, then actually bordered as high watermarks. So really interesting. So documented um, going on. So what's the reason for that? I've put littoral drift. It's basically the predominant wave direction, which is transporting sediment along the coast. We've basically built a big barrier, um, which is blocking that sediment transport um, down the coast. Um, so what I'm saying here is Westport exists. We probably wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for the port. So we've got to acknowledge the port's given a lot to Westport. But at the same time, we also need to, uh, to realise that by modifying the coastline, we've also increased our own flood risk. So there's pluses and minuses of everything we do. Every reaction, every action has a reaction. So um, the construction of the port has changed the coastal dynamics. It's blocked the predominant coastal sediment transport paths. Um, and this has resulted in an advancing shoreline, which has therefore increased the flood risk. Um, so I'm now going to run through some flood defences. Sorry, I just feel like I'm hitting you with a machine gun with so much information. There's quite a lot to take in, but there's just too much interesting stuff to tell. So, so bear with me. I'm getting there. Um, so I'm going to start off with the ROIT overflow. In terms of flood protection, we're not talking, I've seen it in the papers, and it's probably miscommunication on our, beh our behalf as to how we describe some of these works, but it's not actually a stop bank. What we have is rock lining along Organs Island. And the purpose of the rock lining was so in the 1880s, they diverted the river. So it used to go around that oxbow, now it goes straight, but nature wants to go back to where it was. And so we are now fighting that river to keep it where it is. So they started putting rocks in in the 1890s, they put in a whole bunch of large boulders. Um, after the 1926 flood, there was millions of dollars thrown at it in today's value and rock lining that. Lasted pretty well, probably a bit of top, top up in the 50s and 60s, but then after the 70s floods, it was damaged again and a lot more investment went in. Um, so it's rock protection and we've just had a bit of a look at this, done some order of magnitude calcs. We'd estimate the value of that rock work, which is protecting Westport to be about $10 million in present day value. Um, and here's just a, what I call a shaded relief 3D map, which just shows some of those overflow paths of where the channels which the, the river naturally flows. Um, and so basically the purpose of that rock is not to stop overflow down the ROYT, although it does help, but it's to channel that river to keep the alignment of the river um, going down the current path rather than diverting or what we call an, having an avulsion, a permanent avulsion down the ROYT when 100% of the flow could go down the ROYT and that could happen naturally if we didn't intervene. Um, and so here's just a few images. I'll just whip through them showing some of that damage and I'm sure some of you have seen this in the papers. Um, and so these photos are provided to me by the Coles. Um, and so the thing I just wanted to point out here was that this entire bank, so this is all along Organs Island, is rock lined. Um, so very significant asset there. Um, the next line of protection are these stop banks. Um, so these different records around who constructed them and when, but they're basically informal stop banks which have been pushed up just the existing dirt uh, which was in place, pushed up some river silt quite likely. Um, but they've had quite a significant impact on protecting Westport over, over years and they've probably, be, probably been significantly undervalued. Um, so they're not on, they haven't been on any official um, asset register. That's partly because there hasn't been a formal rating district um, the way the, the West Coast Regional Council works at least. Um, but they have been very effective at limiting overflows um, in these locations. Um, so this bank, was recorded at being centimetres away from completely overtopping. Uh, if it had overtopped, it probably would have collapsed and scoured out, and you would have had more water in town. So a very valuable asset. Um, here's a picture of it. Quite informal and in a state of disrepair. So um, probably a bit of that scour occurred during the flood. Some of it may have been stock walking over it over the years, people, just general, general lack of maintenance. But there are stop banks around Westport, all of, I'm pointing out. Um, some of them are not as easy to see. If we look at this one here, I'll just go back. That one at the bottom of the screen is actually in the bush. You can't even, you wouldn't even notice that. It's overgrown, but the LIDAR shows it really clearly. If you look at, look at that, you can see it there. But it's not actually very easy to see. 
but it's providing a purpose. So moving on. The railway embankment, not a formal stop bank structure again, but providing a very important purpose for Westport and the current setup. Um, so the railway embankment basically prevents the water which does get around those informal stop banks, and as you saw in July 21, there can be quite a lot of it, um, from overflowing right into the CBD from the top end. Um, so here's a picture um, from, so this is a computer animation of the flood, matches very closely with the flood extents. So the railway is currently preventing flow from entering the top end. So what we found was there was a number of houses that were flooded. There is some theory that some of that actually came from, from backwater coming up the stormwater system um, due to the flat galves not functioning properly or not, maybe not in existent. There's other thoughts that it possibly went over the top of that railway embankment by a small degree. The debris level was in like a centimetre of the top of that. So it's possible some of it did go over the top. And we also think it is just railway gravel. Potentially also a proportion of flow was seeping through the railway embankment. But if we'd had just a few more centimetres of water, definitely a lot more water would have come into town and there'd be a, quite a significant ch chance that that um, embankment would scour out and would have failed. Um, and then we would have had water from the top and the bottom. So I'm now going to run through some, um, some of the main flood mechanisms. So I've already talked about this one to a degree, so I won't dwell on it. But the Orowaiti overflow, so rather than being an engineered overflow, the Buller River, or to my understanding anyway, is um, simply overflows on the true right bank as it exits the gorge. Most water follows the historic river channel and down the Orowaiti. And here's just a wee animation from our model. Um, so you can see water starts filling up in the river. So just so you know, the river channel doesn't show up on this animation. The actual channel itself doesn't show as having water in it. It just shows what's spilling out of the main channel. So the arrows are the direction of flow, and as an arrow gets bigger, it means it's flowing faster. So the biggest arrows are where the majority of the flow is. So you can spilling out of the top end, and it basically heads toward that, towards that overflow channel, um, and then heads towards town. And so that's for about a 50-year event. Once we start getting bigger events, a wider area of the overflow gets covered in the bigger event. The Buller River is already at capacity in that location, so every time we get more water in the river, a bigger percentage goes down the Orowaiti. Uh, and here's just some videos, so sorry, some photographs from helicopter during the flood event. So that just shows the enormity of the amount of water which is coming down the river in that location. Um, and Richard was supposed to be with, with me tonight. He's managed to evade giving this talk. Um, I do wish him well, hope, he, hope he's well. Richard's a good friend of mine. And, um, but basically, Richard's quite a tall guy. He's about two metres tall. Um, and he's, that's Richard surveying after the flood. He's got a two metre long survey staff, and he's reaching up into the trees to get that measurement. So he, that, that flood level was about four metres deep in that location. Um, so we've got a very significant magnitude of very fast flowing water. Um, and in terms of gauging, we had about 1,000 cumics going down there, which is bigger than most rivers in New Zealand. Um, and here's just a sort of showing how it overflows, how it overflowed that wall and scoured out behind it. Um, and again, just pointing out, so I mentioned before the Orowaiti flow split, what the modelling shows is as we have more water coming out the gorge, the Buller River is already full, but there's capacity for the river to go down the Orowaiti. So as we get more flow into the Buller River, we get a higher percentage of that flow is going to go down the Orowaiti. So if we get a bigger flood than what we had in July, a bigger percentage will go down the Orowaiti. Um, the railway bridges at Nine Mile Road, just pointing out, we've got those bridges, funnel flow through. Here's a picture. So this is the 2021 event, and all I want to point out here is the vastness of the volume of water. Those willows down the middle, um, running down there, that's the Orowaiti channel. And so you can just see that the volume of water is so much greater than the Orowaiti channel could ever take. So capacity of the Orowaiti channel, if it would be completely cleared out, it's probably 30, 40 cumics. We've got 1,000 cumics going down the Orowaiti. So no matter what we do, those culverts are completely clogged up in an event like this. The Orowaiti channel is completely overwhelmed. Um, it's just, a, just the nature of the beast. It's a very large amount of water. Um, upstream of the Buller Bridge, I touched on this before, but just to show this just illustrates with the model some of those overflow paths. Um, so coming out in between around the back, and if we get a slightly bigger flood than that over the top of those 
those informal embankments, um, and then potentially heading in, into town. Um, bridge blockage. I just wanted to point out, this is a, a recent photo of debris build up at the Buller Bridge. Um, nothing too significant at the moment that we would get too worried about. I'd personally remove any debris as a precaution because you don't know what's coming down tomorrow, but, but we've got build up at the bridge. Um, and I just want to point out the size of those logs in relation to the bridge piers. So all it takes during a large flood event is for one of these logs to snag. And once you get one, it's a cascading effect. You see it all around the world and in New Zealand, you get one, then you get two, then you get three, then you get five, then you get 10. And they just suddenly fill, build a bit of a localized dam. And what that does is that pushes water levels up locally. And if that increases the water levels at the bridge, that's right where that overflow is on the railway. And that's what the modeling shows with some bridge blockage can push the water up by several hundred mil. Um, and that's when we're in trouble. And here's just a picture. That's a screenshot from that Niwa video, which I showed before one of those big logs going down. It was lucky, didn't get snagged. We've got less piers than we used to, so it's lower probability than in the past, but we had severe bridge blockage in the 70s. Um, and here's just a picture. This is, I believe this is Gisborne, um, just showing what happens once you get a bit of a build up. Um, and I just wanted to show here just what's actually going. You get those vortexes forming at the bridge piers. So it's about a metre lower than the bridge between the piers, but you actually get build up even without any blockage. And so the more, the more resistance you have at those bridge piers, the more likely the water levels will push up. Um, just to point out some of the mechanisms at the floating basin, the lost lagoon area. Um, we've got some low points in the existing bank. Now you will have noticed, well, you may have noticed that these were sandbagged. Um, during the February events at least, to try and prevent some overflow at least, as they're known low points, um, and visibly flooded there in 2012, as well as the recent floods. Um, and then we've got this bank down here past the, what we call the Lost Lagoon, and that's not actually very well sealed. So we have water seeping through that bank. Um, and so that's something which will need to be addressed. Um, not much I can say about the Oroite, apart from as we experienced in July, we have water coming in from everywhere. So we've got water going down Snodgrass, probably one of the first areas that floods because of the low-lying nature of the area. But that goes over the causeway, over the State Highway causeway. Um, but as the river, as the levels rise in the Oroite, we start having water coming in from all angles. Um, and that's just related to the sea level. Um, and that build-up at the Oroite mouth so the water can't get out, it turns right for about five kilometres before it's able to discharge to sea. So that's a significant impedance on flow. Um, so I'm now going to present, so just, again, I put the NIWA logo there just to acknowledge these slides were provided to me by Richard Measures, who, as again, was going to be taking over from me here. Have a bit of tag team, give me a break, uh, as well as you guys a break. So apologies again, but um, you're doing well. <laughs> you're putting up with me for this long, you don't have much option, but... So what I want to talk about, more than future climate change, is current climate change. And so point out that we have evidence that in the past 150 years, the climate's changing. This is freely available data that everybody in this room can get. So if you go to this website, stats.gov.nz, indicators coastal sea level rise, you can download sea level data, um, research grade accuracy survey data of sea level at the major ports around New Zealand. Um, and then the West Coast also has access to data from the Westport Harbour Board um, from 1982 to present. And there's some low quality data recorded from the Charleston Gauge from 1997 to 2012, which is run by NIWA. But just a word of warning, it's not the highest quality. So I would not quite ignore it. It shows a trend, but not place too much reliability on it. So here's just a plot of sea level from 1900 until today. Um, and that says the orange line is Wellington, Wellington Harbour, the blue line is Littleton, and the green line is Westport. Um, what do we see? We see the sea level has been rising for the past 150 years. Here's another plot of that. Um, spread the lines out a little bit so that they're easier to see. Um, we see, um, and you can more clearly see what's going on at Westport. So basically we can see from the start of the Westport data, which was about 1987, we've had a very similar rate of change to what the Littleton gauge is showing, as well as the Wellington gauge. Now, you'll notice it's a little bit steeper, 
if we extrapolate all the way back to 1900, which is not really fair, because the Westport gauge started at 1987, so we're looking at the entire trend, we have quite a bit of a steeper trend, but if we just go to the, to the identical time series, we've got about six and a half millimetres per year of sea level rise currently in the past 20 years for Littleton, and we're getting about the Westport gauge is showing about 9.8 mils. But word of caution, it hasn't been put in place to, as an accurate sea level monitor. It's not maintained to the same degree, and there may be ongoing subsidence on the west port, you know, it's on the, the gauge is on the wharf, so if that wharf is sinking by a little bit. Um, so it may be exaggerating, so I'm not trying to say that west port is accelerating any faster than, than Littleton, but it's quite interesting to look at your very own data compared to Christchurch data, compared to Wellington data, it all shows the same trend. In the last 20 years, we've got quite significant um, sea level rise. So if we go back to 1970, we see that the sea level around New Zealand was about 30 centimetres lower than it is today. And that's just based on the actual measured levels. Um, and so what would that mean for us? So, well, I, I thought it was quite interesting a couple of days ago. I, well, let's just run the model one more time with the July 21, 21 event, and let's lower the sea level by 30 centimetres. And what do we see? We see a slight impact in flood extent. Um, so slight reduction, so a few less houses may have been flooded. Um, you may not say that's very significant. We get about 10 centimetres, 0.1 metre decrease in water levels. Um, and that's purely based on sea level, but as we know, it's not just sea level that's changing, the Orowaiti coastline has grown by one and a half kilometres, so in 1970 the water would have been able to get out much more easily um, than it could today. So combining the growing coastline with sea level rise, we're having a bit of a, bit of a more significant increase in flood levels. If we come down to the bridge, it's very interesting because it's only two centimetres, um, it shows a two centimetre difference in water level at the bridge. But that two centimetres is enough to tip it over the edge. It's like what we call a threshold of flooding. And so we get more water into that sort of Roebuck Menzies area and, um, and it's just enough to tip a little bit of water over the bridge. So in 2021 that, that overtopped, well, I don't know if it overtopped, but the model showing it overtopped, just, just overtopped, if we had lowered that level by a couple of centimetres, there's no overtopping and those houses don't get flooded in the model. So it's just interesting. It's a, it's a 30 centimetre difference in water level, impacts the level at the bridge by two centimetres. That two centimetres is enough to, to change the flood extent. So yeah, quite interesting. Take from it what you want. But um, So the impact on rainfall, what will we say? Warm air carries more moisture. So this is just, I'm not a climate scientist. I work with hydraulics. This is the published research. Warm air carries more moisture and we say it carries about 8% more, mo more moisture per degree of warming. And now all of the um, atmospheric measurements and land temperature measurements we have around the world show that we've already warmed. Um, we've warmed by over a degree already. The Tasman Sea is warming. All the measurements show that the Tasman Sea has been getting warmer over the last 20, 30 years. Um, the atmosphere is warming. All the measurements we have of the atmosphere show that the atmosphere is warming. So it's not about future climate change, it's already warmed. Um, science does predict further accelerated warming, but we're already seeing a signal from the warmer atmosphere. So as a result, warm air carries more moisture. We have one of those atmospheric rivers, as I showed you right at the start, fire hose towards Westport with 8% more water already because we're a degree warmer. Um, so as a result, um, not only do we get more water, more intense rainfall, more rain impacts on sediment. Um, so we have increased rainfall, will loosen more sediment in the upper catchment, more erosion going on, more flows on the river, take material off the bank, put it into the river, so we'd expect more sediment to be entering the river systems. Um, that's something which is often ignored in mainstream media at least. Um, so therefore we've got a potential for increased gravel buildups, and as a result though, what does the river do? It wants more space. So rivers don't just allow a river to build up, they get more sediment, they go wider very well documented all around the world when you get a, get a landslide, put some more sediment into the water, single thread rivers become braided rivers. They expand their width. So we can expect if there's more sediment, there'll be more increased pressure on, on land adjacent to rivers for erosion. Um, and here's just some published papers. I'm not going to go into these, but just some recent internationally published peer-reviewed journals 
um, which have examined the impact of climate change on the July 2021 event. So that first one has, has said that they believe that there's 10% higher rainfall as a result of, of the climate being warmer already in that July 2021 event. Um, so that's my slide. So just as a bit of a summary, just to remind us, what did we go through? Firstly, the Buller catchment is ginormous. It's a very large catchment, but it's got a very small floodplain with Westport centred right in the middle of it. Westport is exposed to multiple hazards, as I showed you. Stormwater flooding, river flooding, landslide dam, coastal flooding, tsunami, as well as earthquakes, uh, liquefaction. Long history of flooding. This is not something new. If we don't believe in climate change, it doesn't matter. We're still exposed to flooding because we have a history of very large floods. The 1926 event was much larger than anything in recent years, as was the 1870 event. Um, the landscape is changing. Landscapes change naturally, but also every human impact on a landscape changes it. Constructing the port, has, the breakwaters, has caused the coastline to grow. Uh, we can see it very carefully. That's exacerbated our flood risk. The river's been diverted in 1880s with the relief channel, but it's always going to want to go back down the Orowaiti. It's a fact, it's the natural flow path of the Buller River is to go down the Orowaiti. So that's what it's trying to do. So we're fighting against nature. Um, there's currently minimal flood defences in place for quite a significant hazard. Um, and the magnitude of, of a very large flood is much larger than any drain clearing or the local network can possibly take. Um, there's a very delicate balance at the flow split. If we push more water down the Orowaiti, we'll get more flooding from that side. If we push more water down the Buller, we might get more flooding from the Buller side. Um, the climate has already changed over the last century and the sea has already risen based on um, all of the measured levels which we have around New Zealand. And I guess the key thing I want to accentuate though is just the rarity. I think I've already said it, but a very large flood event is not an everyday event. It's not something I hope we'll see in our lifetime, but it happened in July. But we can have much larger. We had it in 1926. And the difference, I guess, between storm flooding, which is a, a pain, don't get me wrong, it causes you know, floor level inundation, it can cause lots of problems, but the difference between a really large flood, which we are looking at here for the Buller River, is that it will kill you. If you're in the way of the Buller River, you'll get washed out to sea. We had two-story hotels, buildings washed out to sea in the 1870s. And so it's a massive risk for Westport. We live in the largest river in New Zealand, the largest recorded flood flow in New Zealand, and we have to treat it with care and with caution. It's not an everyday event, but if the event does happen, the consequences are very high, and hence my recommendation that we take the hazard seriously. Um, and then I just mentioned that, again, the temperature has warmed. Um, so that's everything that I have. Thank you for your patience sitting through that presentation. And Bob's going to take over from me now, I believe, and chair the um, question and answer session. <laughs> Well, that was certainly a very enlightening and very fascinating presentation, packed full of good technical information, but also well presented and certainly, I think, in many instances, relatively easy to understand. And that certainly showed a snapshot of what we face both in the past and perhaps into the future as well. Now, as I mentioned before, if you've got questions that are directly related to the subject matter that Matt's been explaining to you, we'd be more than happy to accept those. If you don't want to stand up and put those out. Um, you will have an opportunity later where you can actually get them recorded and they'll be fed back into the, to the information that's sent back out to you. So don't feel embarrassed. But we're more than happy to accept questions relating to the flood modelling work and climate. Um, so I believe the question was why did we have the biggest flood in the 20s? Well, it's the biggest, it's the biggest not necessarily the biggest flood, uh, it's the biggest estimated flood. So, so based on they've got records of what the river level was in the 1920s, um, and they are able to, to back calculate from that as the water level in the Buller River up the gorge up at um, Hawke's Crag was much higher than anything else since then. And I don't believe that we have records of anything higher. Um, hence, 
the scientists call it the largest flood in New Zealand history. <laughs> Last year I went to a maritime conference on our, our tsunamis and um, uh, surges affect our ports and the, um, the expert, the, the, the keynote speaker there on uh, New Zealand tsunamis. And he, he said um, that we've, there is no proof that we've had a tsunami here on the west coast. I talked to him after he spoke actually. And he said the only chance that a tsunami is going to happen here um, is from the Solomon Islands and we'll get about eight to eight and a half hours of um, notice. Uh, so he, he basically believes that the, the talk of the, of the history of, of this area when people have believed the tsunamis have actually been floods. So I just want to make that comment as a report. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much for that comment. So I'm, I'm not a personal expert in tsunamis. I've had been at talks and heard experts talk about a history of tsunamis. So, but very happy to, to take that on board and would be very interesting to research. Yep, that'd be great, thank you. Did Picasso draw that map or who drew that map, the old one? Oh, the old one. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. beautiful map. So, I'm, it was, I'm not sure, it was put together by the, by the survey board or whatever at the time. They very carefully mapped out the, the streets and measured the distances using chains and everything. And um, amazing level of detail they had back in the old days um, without the modern technology that we have, highly accurate. Highly accurate maps, so yeah, hats off to them. I couldn't do it. Shane? Um, in, that, in that initial weather pattern that you spoke about that shows, you know, that is the pattern that we've had the, and we've had the big floods, how um, much time do we get, you know, that we, we know where in New Zealand it's going to hit? Is that kind of like just we wait for the telemetry stuff or is it, um, you know, how much notice would we know that it's going to hit Westport as opposed to further north or Brisbane? Okay, sure. So that's a, that's a very question. So basically my understanding of how much notice can we get? So um, we're never certain of the weather. The weather is the weather. It can change. It's got its own mind. But you can see a strong indication in the weather pattern several days out um, based on the forecasting which NIWA were doing and using the Met Service data. I know that at least three days out from the July flood, they were giving a strong indication. We were expecting quite a significant event in Westport. Um, but what we're currently working on, um, so NIWA have quite a, like a, a five-year contract, I believe, which is working on developing a more reliable flood forecasting system. But we've got to realise the scope of that is to give eight hours warning. And so, and eight hours with a degree of certainty. So we're not, we're not crying wolf. But that project's just started. It's five years long. So we're working towards trying to be able to give a reliable eight-hour warning. But we will always give that we will always be able to see, you can just see from how the weather system is forming, looking at, the, at, your, at your highs and lows, and we can see the weather system approaching. About three days out, we were getting a signal. Um, the certainty of that, that's the problem. How far out do you, do you say, hey, because it can change direction very quickly. Um, if it was up to you, would you recommend widening the Urawati overflow or closing it? Um, so just, sorry sorry to evade the question, but I have been instructed that we're not talking about um, okay. optioneering tonight. So I've been yeah, asked just to avoid talking about solutions. Right, that's well. Thank you. Hi, um, I just wondered if there's been any modelling done on how a big impact in the catchment of the bulla would impact the flooding down here. Sorry, can you, you I didn't quite capture that question. Sorry, has there been any modelling done on how a big earthquake further up in the catchment of the bulla would impact flooding down here? I oh, got you, thank you. So, so what impact would an earthquake have? So... I haven't seen any specific modelling. Um, however, what we could deduce is basically we could expect um, significant increase in sediment input. 
there's risk of landslide dam as, as has occurred previously. So landslide dam, you get a lot of material falls down and blocks the river. The river slowly builds up behind the dam and when that finally overtops or bursts, you get a big rush of water suddenly coming down quite rapidly, but not just water mixed with sediment. So there's, there's some risk definitely for, for landslide dam and probably you would get a long-term ongoing input of increased sediment coming into all of the rivers in the, in the west coast, but if it's focused around the bullet catchment, then you'd expect more sediment input, um, which will likely increase flood risk. Frank? Uh, mate, oh no, um,